Hi everyone, in this episode we're going to be importing our character into the Unity game engine, and we'll also start programming the basics of our character controller. Alright, so with a new Unity project open, I'm going to head over to where I have the character blend file stored, and just drag and drop this into the project window. And that'll take a moment to import, and we can then go onto the rig settings here, and we can change the animation type from generic to humanoid, which will just give us access to Unity's inverse kinematics features, which we'll play around with a little bit later on in the series. Uh, for now, we'll just hit apply, and we can then press configure to see this all set up. And hopefully your little guy is all green, which means that all the bones were correctly set up in Blender. Uh, one thing that's a bit weird is the character's pose over here. What we should do is just double click on our character to open the blend file and we can just close the animation and then here in the scene just select all of the bones in pose mode and press Alt R, Alt G to get him back to his uh, standard T pose and then we can save and in Unity we can then just come down here and just tell it to reset the pose and it's now in the T pose. Alright, let's say we're done and yes we want to apply wait a moment, and then let's head over to the Animations tab, and we want to go through all of these and just say loop time, so that they will loop when they're finished playing. So do that for the walk as well, and then press Apply. Okay, let's grab our character and just drag him into the scene, and we're going to want to create an animator controller for him, so right click in the project window, create, and where is that? Over here, create a new animator controller, and I'll just call that animator. And then we'll select the character in the scene and just drag the animator uh, controller into the controller slot here. Now, because we animated our character walking and running on the spot, we're not going to be using root motion, but I would like to quickly talk about root motion for those of you not familiar with it. So the idea is to actually animate the root bone of the character. For example, in a walk animation, the character would be animated to move forwards. This starter is then used to move the character around in the game, instead of the traditional uh, approach of controlling movement from a script. The big advantage of this is that you can properly time movement to the animations, eliminating visual problems like foot sliding. So working with root motion allows one to create more natural looking movements, but what you lose is the ease and precision of controlling the character's movement from script. This can often lead to the player's movement feeling less responsive to input, which obviously detracts from the gameplay. I certainly don't mean to deter you from ever using root motion, one can get great results with it, uh, but for this series we're going to be sticking with script-based movement. Okay, all of that was just a really long way of saying that we're going to be turning this toggle off. Let's then double click on the animator to bring up the animator window. I'm going to middle mouse drag, so this is properly in view. So we want to create a blend tree so that uh, we can blend between idle, walking, and running based on the character's speed. So we're going to right click here, say create state from new blend tree. All right. And if we go into our parameters, we can see it's added in a blend float. Uh, let's rename this to something like speed percent. And then let's double click on our blend tree here. We can see it's got uh, a list of motions, which is currently empty. We can press the plus button and just add in three motion fields. And then let's fold out the character model here so that we can see the animations. We'll drag the idle animation into the first slot, then the walk into the second, and the run into the third. Now, I'd like to be able to see the scene view. So I'm just going to dock the game window down here, and then drag the animator out into a separate window, just like so. Uh, let's press play. And we're going to need to make sure that we select the character so that uh, the animator for the character is active. And then we can play with the speed percent value. Uh, currently, the animations are looking a little bit weird. Uh, you can see the character isn't uh, moving up and down and it's a little bit jerky. 
what we need to do is go into the character here and just uh, go into any one of these animations. Let's go into the motion field and just set the root motion node to be root transform. If we then hit apply, that will update for all of the animations. And if we try this out now, we can see that the animation looks uh, correct. And we can drag this up to one to get them running and bring it back down to zero to return to the idle animation. Of course, the speed percent parameter is going to be controlled from our player controller script, which we'll create in just a moment. I first want to make a ground plane though for the character to stand on. Uh, we can just use a regular plane, but I'm going to import Unity's prototyping package so we can get the nice grid floor. So just assets, import package, prototyping. And uh, I don't want any of this cross-platform input or utility stuff, just the prototyping one. So let's import that. Wait a moment. And when that pops up in our assets, we can go over to the prefabs. And I'm going to look for the floor. That's awfully small. It's not the one I'm looking for. Maybe this one. No, the third one. That's the one. All right, let's just reset its position. All right, that's very nice. Um, I'm going to want to make my game window a little bit bigger. So I'm going to dock the animator over here and just bring the game window back. All right, like so. And let's right click here and just create a new C sharp script. I'm going to call this the player controller. Okay, let's double click to open this. And in the update method, I'm going to start off by creating a vector2 for the keyboard input. So vector2 input is equal to a new vector2. And we're going to get the horizontal input. So input dot get axis raw, horizontal. And then for the y axis, that will be our vertical input. So input dot get axis raw, vertical. Let's now take our input vector and turn it into a direction. So we can say vector to input direction is equal to input dot normalized. From this, we can figure out our character's rotation using trigonometry. So imagine this line is our input direction. We of course know it's vertical and horizontal components, and we're trying to find the angle it forms, which we can call theta. If you've studied trig at all, you know that tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, so theta is simply arctan of y over x. This assumes that we start with zero degrees over here and increase anti-clockwise. In unity, however, if our character is facing forwards, then it has a rotation of zero. Facing right, it has a rotation of 90 degrees, and so on. So let's call r the rotation of our character in unity. If you look at the two circles, it's clear that we need r to be 90 minus theta in order for our character to face the correct way. We can simplify this a tiny bit by saying r is equal to arctan of x over y. All right, let's go ahead and set our character's rotation by saying transform.eulerangles is equal to vector3.up, since we want to rotate around the y-axis, multiplied by what we just calculated, so mathf.atan of input direction.x divided by input direction.y. Now, of course, if input direction.y is zero, we're going to get division by zero errors, so instead of having to worry about that ourselves, we can use the handy mathf.atan2 method, which allows us to pass in the two values separately, and it will worry about all of that stuff for us. So we can just say input direction.x, comma, input direction.y instead. Now, this octan method is going to return the angle in radians, and we want it in degrees, so we're going to just multiply this by the conversion factor, which is mathf dot uh, radians two degrees. All right, if we save that now and go into Unity, we'll need to quickly add the player controller script to the character object. And then we can test this out by pressing either the arrow keys or WASD. And you can see the character rotates around. Uh, one thing that you will notice is that if you release uh, all of the keys, 
the character will snap back to facing forwards. So what we'll want to do is only calculate the rotation if the input direction is not 0, 0. So in other words, if input direction is not equal to vector 2.0, then calculate the rotation. Next, we can make the character actually move in the direction he's facing. So let's create two public variables up here, a public float walk speed, I'll set this to 2, and a public float run speed, maybe set that to 6. So let's say you have to hold down the shift key to run, so we can say bool running is equal to input dot get key, key code dot left shift, and then we can say float speed is equal to, and this is going to depend on whether we're running or not, so let's open parentheses and say running, and then question mark to say if we are running, then speed is going to be equal to run speed, otherwise, so colon, speed is going to be equal to walk speed. Now, of course, if we aren't holding any keys down, then the speed should be zero. So let's enclose all of this in parentheses and multiply it by input direction dot magnitude. So if there's no input, the magnitude will be zero, uh, in which case the speed will be zero. Otherwise, the input direction's magnitude will be one, uh, which won't change the speed. All right, so now to actually move the character, let's say transform dot translate we want to move in the direction the character is facing so transform dot forward multiplied by the speed we calculated multiplied by time dot delta time and we want to uh, move the character in world space so we're going to say comma space dot world all right let's save this and try it out so press play and we can move around, and if we hold down shift, then we move faster. Okay, let us now uh, control the speed percent value in the animator so that uh, the character actually walks or runs depending on the speed. So uh, back in the script, we can create a float. Uh, let's call it animation speed percent. All right. So if we're running, then this is going to be equal to 1. Otherwise, it's going to be equal to 0.5. And just like we did with the uh, speed over here, we're going to multiply this by input direction dot magnitude. All right, now we need to get a reference to the animator component. So let's say animator, animator, and then... I'm just going to remove these comments quickly. In the start method, we can say animator is equal to get component of type animator. All right. And then we simply say animator.setFloat. We need to give it the name of the float, which is speed percent. Make sure you spell it exactly the same here as you do in the uh, animator window. And then we pass in the value, which is our animation speed percent variable. Okay, let's try this out. So here we're walking, if we stop, we go back to the idle animation, and if we hold shift, we run, and we can go into the animator here and actually watch the speed percent value change as we do this. All right, so we've got the basics of our character controller working now, but what would be nice is if uh, everything wasn't so abrupt, if there was some smoothing, uh, both to the rotation and to the uh, speed adjustment. So let's start by smoothing out our rotation. So instead of directly setting Euler angles to the rotation value, we're going to treat this as a target rotation and we'll be smoothing Euler angles towards it over time. So let's cut that out and create a float called target rotation, set that equal to that. And then we'll set transform.euler angles equal to vector3.up multiplied by our smoothing function, which is mathf.smoothdampangle. We want to pass in the current angle, which is transform.eulerangles.y. 
we want to pass in the target angle, which is just our target rotation variable. And then we need two more variables, which we can create quickly. First of all, we need a float called something like uh, turn smooth time. I'll set this equal to 0 0.2 by default. So this is just approximately the number of seconds that it will take for the smooth damp method to go from the current value to the target value. All right, then we also need a float called something like uh, turn smooth velocity. Now this variable, we don't ever uh, modify ourselves. We just sort of feed it to the smooth damp method and it makes use of it in its calculations. So uh, when we're passing in turn smooth velocity, we need to start with the keyword ref, uh, which just allows the smooth damp method to actually modify its value. So ref turn smooth velocity, and then we pass in our turn smooth time. Okay, let's save this and test it out. So we should see now that the turning happens much more smoothly. And uh, if we increase turn smooth time, so say I turn that up to one second, then the turning should happen uh, more slowly, like so. All right, but I'm going to set that back to point 0.2. Let's now do the same thing for the speed. So uh, I'm going to rename speed to target speed. And then up at the top here, let's create public float uh, speed smooth time. I'll set that equal to 0 0.1. And then we'll see need a float speed smooth velocity and also going to require a float current speed. All right, so then we can say just below target speed, current speed is equal to mathf.smoothdamp. We pass in the current speed value, then our target speed, followed by ref uh, speed smooth velocity, and then the speed smooth time. And then we'll just multiply by current speed over here. Now we can also smooth out the animation speed percent. And uh, we don't need to create any more variables for this because the animator will actually do that for us. We can just say comma, and you can see it uh, has options for a damp time. So uh, we'll just pass in the speed smooth time there as well. And we'll just need to supply the delta time value so time dot delta time. All right, let's save that. And we can try this out now. Everything should feel much smoother. No more abruptness. All right, so that is actually everything for this episode. So until next time, cheers.